Hello and welcome to House Calls. I'm Vivek Murthy and I have the honor of serving as U.S. Surgeon General. Today we'll be talking about the healing power of music. This is part one of a two-part conversation. We're rolling House Calls episode 35 with guest cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Let's sync sound. Ouch. <laughs> I always have that instinct too. Really? When it snaps, like, <laughs> like almost like I got pinched. <laughs> Yo-Yo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining House Call. Thank you so much for uh, making that house call. And I have so many problems I don't want to talk to you about. <laughs> well, we can talk about all of that because we're here in person, which I, I love doing these recordings in person. It's great. But before we start, sure. there's something very important we have to do, which is I learned that recently you celebrated a birthday. Yes. So... <clears throat> Uh oh! I have a little treat here. Oh my with a goodness! Candle on it. Oh, that's so adorable. Mm. And I'm going to subject you to my rendition of "Happy Birthday." Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Yo Yo. Happy birthday to you. This is the yeah, sweetest, thank you so much. sweetest birthday <laughs> song greeting I think I have ever had. That's beautiful. Oh, well. What a bite. I hope you enjoy it. It's vegan. <laughs> we, we'll share it together. Go How ahead. about that? You, you, your first no, Your you birthday. Go. Your you birthday. Go. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll take. All right. Okay. Great. Beautiful. I feel like we're at chef's table. Ah, this is great. We are literally breaking bread together. This mm -hmm. is nice. Nice. Food certainly is a comfort and does cut down on loneliness. It can definitely bring people together. And in fact, I was thinking the very first time you and I met mm -hmm. was around food. We were at a, a dinner together, and um, I remember your laugh because you have such a wonderful laugh. It is full-throated, it's full-hearted, and it just resonates around the room. And I, whenever you laugh, I can't help but feeling better. And that's just one of my memories of you, is your laugh, Yo-Yo. <laughs> it's funny because my memory of you was your kindness. Mm. I just thought, this guy is really thoughtful. And this is in Washington, D.C., where <laughs> people are very, you know, focused. Mm. And, and you were so unusually thoughtful and kind, and it makes total sense that you're now talking about loneliness, hmm. because I think the two was, you know, the, the the twin poles of what you're trying to focus on are deeper issues that can plague all of us, hmm. and uh, so that was that was wonderful, and and then of course. Each meeting that we've had, you were always concerned about trying hmm. to to do something, both in your position, but also uh, as a human being, uh, to address a social issue in a way that that can be broad but personal. Hmm. Well, thank you. What a kind thing to say, Yo Yo. Thank so, you. That's what I remember. See, food makes me remember things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're very funny. You know, it's funny. The, the time that we met after that was also around food. And I remember when we were ordering food at this restaurant, I think I ordered something that was like, I don't know, an egg white omelet with vegetables. Uh -huh. And when it came your turn, you looked at me, you gave me this mischievous look, and you looked at the, the waitress and you said, can I get some bacon? Is that okay, <laughs> even though it's not super healthy? <laughs> and I said, of course, go ahead. Please get whatever you want. <laughs> but That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really quite funny, but uh, I love we'll that. We'll put a partition bacon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife loves bacon. So I actually make bacon for my wife, like on her birthday. Uh, it's my, one of my things. I go to the store. I Wait, and you're not tempted? Mm, no, actually. You know, I, I've, I've been... I haven't eaten meat for a very long time, mm -hmm. and um, I, I love the smell of bacon. Mm -hmm. I, I think it smells great, and I remember it tasted great too. Right. You know when I uh, when I used to eat it, but um, yeah, for some reason now I don't feel that. That's tempted. great. You know what tempts me? Yo-yo is sweets. That's my that's uh -huh. my problem. I have uh -huh. like you know many many sweet teeth, and so if I'm around, so I try to stay away from desserts like cakes and all that stuff because that that's where my temptation can come in. Mm -hmm. So good for you. Yeah. Well, well, you see. look. 
healthy, which is great, which is more Thank than you. I can say for myself. <laughs> but then I'm so much older than you are. So it's a, you know, that's... Well, you look great, actually. And, you know, speaking of looks, you know, one of the things that I find myself thinking about, I was thinking about before we were chatting was this question of how we look to the outside world, like mm -hmm. what the world thinks your identity is. I know that for you, Yo-Yo, you send so much deep thinking about identity. And what was struck me is that in some of the conversations that you've had with others, is that your leading identity isn't as a musician, right? Which I think is how the world looks at you as this virtuoso cellist and extraordinarily gifted musician. But it was striking to me that you put human first as your identity, and then musician second, and then cellist third. But I'd love to, to maybe start there and talk a bit about how you see your identity now and what you see your mission uh, as a human. Well, what time is it now? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. Well, I see myself as an older person. Hmm. So I just turned 68. And what's, what's interesting about being that age, I think there's several parts to my identity because deep in my heart, I'm still a seven-year-old, uh -huh. you know, and deep in my heart, I'm somewhere along the line, I'm still a teenager, mm. subject to all the things that, you know, seven-year-olds and teenagers might be, but, you know, trapped in the body of a 68-year-old. Mm. But I also have partly a developed 68-year-old mind, mm. and, and that I'm really relishing mm. because you see trouble coming at you from further away. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the sweets, right? <laughs> I'm not going to go by that pastry shop because I know I'm going to be tempted, <laughs> right? And so in a sense, life experience is helpful. Mm. Uh, and and I've learned enough to try and as bad as the news might be, mm or the news cycle, uh, to actually deliberately try and spend a smaller proportion of time digesting news, like bad news, hmm. and spending the greater proportion of time trying to be around people who are trying to do constructive things. Hmm. That actually evens out the mood swings. And, you know, I, so I, yes, I can get depressed, hmm. but, but I, I know that I, I have certain levers hmm. in terms of how I spend time that will affect how I feel. So that's really powerful because I think what you're touching on, I think, is something a lot of people are going through right now, which right. is this feeling that every time they turn on the news or pick up the paper, that they're just barraged with with negativity and, and with what's wrong with the world. There's very little of, of what's right about the world or very little to feel hopeful about. And I was curious like what some of those levers are or places that you, that you reach for when you're feeling either pessimistic or feeling like the negativity is building too much. Well, you know, starting with food, uh -huh. <laughs> you open the fridge and say, <laughs> I feel terrible. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and that works only up until the time that, you know, none of your clothes fit anymore. <laughs> and then you realize, no, that's Fair not enough. such a good option. Yeah. You know, I don't want to buy new clothes. Mm. So so you have to turn to something else. And I'm sure many people say the same thing because family and friends mm. matter. Mm. If you have friends, what kind of friends do you have? Are they friends that, you know, you could talk about specific things, you know, your niche friends, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I talk about, you know, comic books with this person, mm -hmm. <laughs> movies with another, or or you share, you know, your existential self yeah. with them, you know, what's life about, mm -hmm. or about, you know, things that are way beyond our understanding. You open the papers or you read every day, there's so many new discoveries, mm -hmm. so many people are trying so hard for years, decades of work to suddenly get to, you know, mm. a way of, you know, the, the health sciences, the universe, James Webb telescope, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's, it's a new theories. And you just say, wait a minute, these are people who are actually moving ahead in time 
long before their work is going to directly affect us, but they're doing it, mm. right? They're like the people at the edge of of knowledge or yeah. of experiment or of adventure or whatever, and they're taking risks. Mm -hmm. So that's that's comforting because um, it's like the people who can see the cliff before you see it and say, yeah. wait a minute, stop, there's yeah. a cliff there. I think uh, about 10 years ago, I was working with a colleague and I was like in a bad state. Hmm. And uh, Brooke, she suggested, she said, you know, try gratitude. Hmm. I said, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, you know, sometimes it's an easy word, hmm. but it's actually to make space for that is incredible. Hmm. And so part of during the pandemic, I... I went into the national parks and met with a lot of incredible people, scientists, park rangers, indigenous folk, native people, and started in Acadia National Park with the Wabanakis. And so big circle, it's you thank the creator, mm. you know, for everything, right? Everything around. And you're part of it. Mm -hmm. And and you do this over and over and over okay. again in different places. I was suddenly included in a group mm. that I otherwise would not belong, but I, they played host to my being a guest. Mm -hmm. And so we activated some thousands-year-old tribal ritual of ho guest and host. Uh, we practice that all the time, yeah. right? But I was a guest in that circle, mm. and suddenly I could partake in their way of welcoming the sun every morning and of then talking and saying what's on their mind. Another one in Alaska recently, uh, I was in a group of people and we each introduced ourselves and they, the way people introduce themselves is say, I'm so-and-so, this is my full name, mm -hmm. these are all my ethnicities, these are my grandparents and whatever. So it's like you see the person in front of you, but that person is surrounded by mm -hmm. sort of their relations and family and, mm -hmm. and tribal units. And then we were asked to say, and who would you bring in the circle right now? Huh. So an additional person that you can say, okay, I want this person to imagine, but you know, who may not be with us anymore mm -hmm. or far away, they're then part of this. Changes the tone of conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, so so I think there I, so I've lately experienced those types of of interactions that make me realize that you know I live in a very no matter how open I try to be my world is still very siloed. Mm -hmm. And what you spoke about earlier about each time that you did something a little risky, uh -huh. right? You know, the technology <clears throat> company, okay, to volunteer for this and to start some public service organization, it's it's a risk. It takes, it's a place that's not familiar and you're making an experiment. Mm -hmm. And is that going to work? Yeah. And and then and then I see that what what you said, you never thought you'd work in government because it's too slow. You do a technology company which works at a credibly, mm -hmm. you know, fast rate. And now you put two knowledges in your head mm -hmm. together and you can activate that. Mm -hmm. So I think, so thinking and thinking about how different things fit together, mm -hmm. pieces, in order to gain a little bit more clarity mm -hmm. actually helps with your own you know, mood. Yeah. Right? So it's like saying, and there are moments, I don't know if you feel that way, but there are moments when suddenly something becomes clear and it's, it's, and you've been wrestling with something and then suddenly yes. there's a path forward. Mm -hmm. You don't know when or why exactly it happens, but they do happen. Mm -hmm. And if you put yourself in a position where there's more frequency of that happening, that's also an arc. Mm -hmm. a positive arc that you can hold on to 
um, during times of of chaotic thinking. Oh yeah, then that absolutely makes sense. And I, you speak to a kind of openness and a way of op- approaching life with openness, so that you can take those tracks that are unplanned but that present themselves periodically in life and create experiences that um, that teach you and, and perhaps guide you in new directions. And I remember when I was reading a bit about about your story, Yo-Yo, I, I love the story of how you your parents gave you an instrument when you were two and a half years old, I believe it was. Yeah, perhaps yeah a violin. violin, yeah. And had you play around with it perhaps and try to play, but then thought, oh, he doesn't seem to have I an screeched. aptitude for music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that sounded so awful. And said he's probably not going to be uh, a musician. Right. Um, obviously, we know that things turned out quite differently. But it kind of it made me wonder, you know, thinking about like your own experience as a ch- as a child, going from uh, that to where you are now. I think that there are a lot of children um, who have dreams, dreams of what they want to do, who they want to be when they grow up, and then fears get in the way. Right. Other people's opinions get in the way, and they start to doubt whether they can do it. This is an artist that uh, my daughter really loves. Uh, her name is Lily Mayola. And she's a song called Daydream. And there's a line in that song which says, all these things we say we'll get to are shot shot down by the reasons not to. Mm -hmm. And that seems to play out all the time, that we dream of these things, but then we figure, come up with all these reasons why it could never happen. And we start doubting ourselves. For you, what, what gave you belief? What gave you faith? What helped you move forward uh, with this extraordinary career that you've built in music? And did you have moments of doubt? Did you have moments where you thought, gosh, I'd love to do this, but I'm not really sure if I have what it takes? Well, you might be surprised mm-hmm. to hear that um, that even though, or maybe because I started playing an instrument at a very early age, I never felt that I could or had to make a decision to be a professional musician. Mm. You know, I loved music, but any profession is the same because it involves people Mm -hmm. with the jostling of, you know, of people. And it's it's the same in, I think, in every sector. Mm -hmm. Um, So... So I didn't particularly want to be a professional musician. I had tiger parents who were like, mm-hmm. you know, sort of saying, okay, you know, you're going to do this. And I'm also an immigrant. Mm-hmm. And I have the immigrant energy of saying there's very little safety net. You know, mm-hmm. you can't depend on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, I'm going to take the weekend off. You know, I'm mm-hmm. just going to go uh, <laughs> yeah. to the country, you know. And yeah. I, there's there's not that. Yeah. And so, so the so there's the pressure to say, well, you, you better do something, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 you better do it well. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so that was certainly in my background. So I had parents that had high hopes and ideals for what I should be doing, and also probably parents that also lived through the child, you know, and which is slightly less healthy, I think, mm, mm. Um, but very much understandable yeah. in an immigrant situation because it's like, okay, well, you know, we did this and now uh-huh. you better, <laughs> <laughs> you better, right? And so I was, so I grew up, you know, and, and with the benefit of having gone to college, mm. which opened me up to so many incredible friends or people who, thought differently about things. Mm. And I was not a particularly good student. Mm. You know, I I just relished being with a group of people sort of my own age or at slightly older. But I was fascinated by what they were doing and what was around me. Mm. Um, And it wasn't until after I graduated from college I realized 
<laughs> it was wasted on me. You know, it's like <laughs> I walk by 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 uh, uh, the library and say, you know, and see these dorms. Says, my goodness, they built all of this <laughs> for us. You know, <laughs> seventeen to twenty-one years old, and. <laughs> And what were we doing with all this? <laughs> it was a it was a sad revel, revelatory moment, and but what I decided to mm. do is to say, well, you know, I can actually spend the rest of my life really learning, just explore, mm. and which I tried to do for many many decades, always thinking, what might I I have done if I was not doing music. Mm. You know, so I'd have and what's a, the answer to that? What do you think you may have done? Well, I don't know because it just depends on what uh. what I so what I realized at age 49 mm -hmm. was that I knew what I loved. I loved anthropology, I loved archaeology, I loved history, I loved sciences, I loved people. Mm. I says I loved people. I said, okay, all right. So that's and and then I thought, you know, I could explore all of these subjects through the lens of music. Mm. And so that was when I decided, okay, it's okay to be a musician. And th th this is actually one of the things that I think fascinates me about you as a musician, is that it's more than a job, it's more than a skill to you, but you describe it as a way to engage with people, to connect with people. And that comes across so beautifully and clearly, not just in the notes that you play, but in how in the projects that you build, whether it's a Silk Road project or or you know other projects where you have, you've used music as a way to bring people together, to help us appreciate each other and our world more. Um, you've used mu music as a source of healing. And I mean, I was curious sort of when you realized that music could be that kind of force, a force for connection and healing. And how did that come about that you had that insight? Um, well, both early, during, and late. Very early on, so I must have been about four or five. Huh. You know, I realized that there was there there were two connecting movements uh, in a Bach cello suite, cello solo, that I loved connecting them, you know, that the end of one, mm -hmm. and there's a silence between, you know, the end of something and the beginning of something, but that that silence was like a pregnant pause, and there was something huh. extraordinary about that, and I loved that thing, mm -hmm. right? Because it was comforting, it was something that later on, I could then describe that as getting to a state of mind. Mm. And that's where the, the comfort uh -huh. healing part comes in. So fast forward maybe a couple decades, we got more letters from people who were going through hard times, mm. whether they were about to go through an operation or, you know, lost a friend or they were ill or they were studying for, you know, exams and stuff. They turned to some of those Bach mm. pieces. So I said, wait a minute, this is there's something, there's some power in this music mm. that seems to, you know, take people to a place that they needed to be in, whether mm. it's to concentrate or to relieve stress or to deal with worries or whatever, but there's something in that. So that's what made me start thinking, how do I get this out to more people? Mm. And you know, so for about five years, I worked on six documentaries with, with uh, pairing each of the six suites with an artist of a different kind. You know, uh, it was a filmmaker, dancer, garden designer, kabuki dancer, and mm -hmm. ice skaters, Torvald and Dean, and made those documentaries. You know, 
PBS, BBC, you know, it's like sort of did that. And to to show, and I don't I have no idea whether it, it was an experiment. The experiment mm-hmm. was that if another person in a different creative field lives with a piece of music for a year, you know, they have that in their psyche, their, mm-hmm. you know, mental DNA, right? Then how would that piece evolve in their art form? Mm. It's kind of like a, you know, a biological experiment yeah. with a piece of music. Mm-hmm. And so we have six of those, you know, and this is, that was the result. It was not to prove anything else except to say, okay, we're we're going to make that experiment. Mm-hmm. So that was an early for it. Then it was the Silk Road, which was right after the Oslo Accords. Mm-hmm. I was actually in Israel. And the next day went with a number of friends across um, the Allenby Bridge, first to Petra in Jordan, and then mm-hmm. to Aqaba mm-hmm. in, in Jordan. And then I was asked on the way back uh, to stop by Amman and do a master class for some young Jordanian students. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they played. I asked them what they were playing, why they were playing it. And their answers were so rich in poetry and philosophy. And that was one of the moments that I thought we should have like a Middle Eastern youth orchestra. Mm. uh, Because, as you know, talent is everywhere. Mm. Right, brains are everywhere. Intelligence is everywhere. It's not, you know, geographically limited. So it says, let's kind of let's do this. Let's mm-hmm. try, and that grew into a Silk Road project. And you know, so it's all separate events that made me think of things. I think the one event from from uh, an undergraduate class. Mm. Uh, was an anthropology class where we were looking at um, films made by the Marshall family on the Sun people in in um, in Botswana and, and mm-hmm. Namibia. And there was one film of a blind musician. I was so mesmerized by the music. I thought I want to go there one day and and find out about their music and their trans dance practices. Which then, mm-hmm. by accident, I sent this to a reporter and. I was approached by a filmmaker to say, mm-hmm. "Will you go do a documentary?" Which I did in the '80s, uh-huh. and um, and that foray into a place that was probably the furthest away from anything I'd experienced before led me to understand that in their tra- that trans dance practices, where you know the women are sitting in a circle and the men take a hallucinogenic drug which is not never abused mm. as opposed to alcohol mm-hmm. and there's talent involved in people who can go into trance laying of hands mm-hmm. they open freely people in other villages are welcome to join mm-hmm. in order to be cured of what they feel they need to be cured of so there's a generosity aspect to it you join and interviewing two of the women the next day, I said, so why do you do this? Because, you know, to me, that ritual turns into medicine, religion, art, culture, dance. Yeah. And and she said, well, because it gives us meaning. Hmm. So that experience has, I think, pretty much been the foundation of everything that I try to do. You, know, you do it, stuff because it gives you it gives meaning. Meaning, yeah. And who does it give meaning to? Hmm. What is the meaning? If music can take you to a particular state of mind, hmm. that's a kind of medicine, right? If you can, exactly, you know, it's yeah. without drugs. It's 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 energy. It moves air molecules. It somehow we interpret that in a certain way for your daughter. That you know, it's something affects you and you are then feeling temporarily better. And that's where I, I think you're spot on in in underscoring the healing power of music is in part its ability to frame shift our mind and our thinking. And so quickly, you know, sometimes it 
will take us a while to kind of talk ourselves into a different mindset or way of thinking. But sometimes music can just immediately transport us to a different feeling. You know what it reminds me of a little bit, Yo-Yo, is that we, um, for a long time, I don't think, you know, we appreciated how much physical activity shifts your mindset, right? right? And But now we know that when you go outside and you run or when you lift weights, that actually has a, a real measurable effect on your mood. Uh, and in some studies, um, you know, can have almost a similar effect to even medication. I think music also in a very powerful way can shift our mood. And I think at a time when so many people are struggling with their mental health, at a time where as, as a country it feels like sometimes we have descended into more worry and anxiety and, and some pessimism about the future, I often wonder what could shift our way of thinking. And music feels like an incredibly powerful tool, which is why I love your approach to using music as a source of connection, a source of healing, and as you put it, a source of meaning uh, that can speak to us in ways that sometimes words alone can't. Mm -hmm. Well, I I completely, I love your thinking on this and, and bringing that as a a national subject mm -hmm. of for uh, people to focus on. Um, I would say that what makes for an equilibrated human being, you mm -hmm. know, someone who has balance in their lives, you know, they feel like they're, everything mm -hmm. is functioning well. You have to join three parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. And one is metaphorically the brain, mm -hmm. right? You know, functioning brain, using it, and the heart, mm -hmm. the, our ability, again, not the heart as an organ, but the heart the metaphorical heart of a feeling of empathy mm -hmm. of compassion of mm -hmm. of just being in touch with our feelings and yes. join the head and heart oh, and then true. to what you just then described the physical activity hands using your hands using your body mm. uh, that actually because our mind translates into the body. I know, for example, when I play cello, uh -huh. I think of each one of my fingers as little brains because huh. they feel things before I can actually analyze what's happening. Right. So between the so the connection between feeling so people artisanal people who bake, mm. you know, who make this table or who can make this lamp or who work with electronics, they're you know, there's a satisfaction of feeling that is, we've separated it mm -hmm. into white collar workers and, and blue collar workers. And that's a real artificial yeah. thing. It's an, that's an industrial kind of category, Yeah. right? The white collar worker supposedly is like, you know, you have a theory, you got it made, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating, but by joining those aspects of our ways of taking in information and using it to create a whole self. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that is worthwhile considering, especially when, and it goes beyond consumerism. Mm -hmm. You know, if you buy something, it's different than yeah. if you made it. Yes. Right. And and it's not against, you know, it's great that we can buy things, but it's great if we have the pride and the dignity of having made something. And I think it means a lot also something special to the person receiving it. Like I think about the difference it makes when somebody buys you cookies from the grocery store right. versus when they make the cookies for you at home. They may taste the same, but the meaning is profoundly different. The intention's different. Yeah, the intention really now, I matters. I made this for you. For you, yes. The fact that you made this this well, morning. <laughs> I, I will not claim to have made this. I, you uh, didn't make this, birthday. but Patriot someone made it. <laughs> 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 I should. If I was a better person, I would have made it. No, 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 no. Myself. No, you would have been a lesser person because you would have gotten less sleep and you would have gotten mad at somebody for it. You know? <laughs> You know, this part, I just, I'm going to remember what you said about music transporting us from our head into our heart and our body, because it, you know, you and I are, are recording this conversation in 
uh, you know, in Cambridge on the campus that you and I both went to college on at Harvard. I'm literally about 150 feet from the dorm uh, that I actually lived Amazing. in uh, when I was here. But I remember one of my things in, in college is I remember I was in my head all the time. I was always studying. I was always like, trying to think about the future, plan this, plan that, whatever. And it was only when I actually went to residency training later, when I was working like 80 plus hours a week, you know, seeing life and death in front of me every day, dealing with critical decisions, seeing so much human suffering, that I actually turned to music and to dance. And I found that what was powerful, and it happened a bit by accident, but what was powerful is that I found being in my body as I danced and having music speak to my heart and allow me to, in a way, almost like mobilize and reconnect with these emotions mm -hmm. that I had, but which I had walled off, that was incredibly therapeutic for me. And so it became part of my residency experience. I learned to be to salsa dance. I would listen. I would turn to music more often. Um, but to me, it speaks to the healing power of music, and it's something I think we need so much uh, in our country, certainly in, here in the United States. And one of the reasons why I feel very committed to to seeing how we can use music as a as a force for healing, uh, following, of course, in the beautiful example you've laid out. But I think that this is something that we need in the world. The projects that you have built involve the world. Right, I think you're recognizing that recognizes that we are all deeply connected as human beings, and music, and we're all suffering in in different ways. But music can be a way that we can understand each other, and if we do it right, my hope is that it can be a way of creating a culture around kindness and around compassion, around curiosity and exploration of each other. I think it's an extraordinarily really powerful force. Well, quick question. When you did salsa dancing yeah. as a resident, yeah. did that in any way change your approach to bedside manner? That's a very interesting question. Um, it actually did a little bit in the following way. I think it gave me a deeper well of energy, but also compassion. And because I was more in touch with my emotions, I found myself more able to be in touch with patients when they shared about their emotional journey, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to getting tired or feeling like I was burning out. I was more able to stay present, to appreciate those parts of their journey, and to ask more deeply mm -hmm. about the emotional part of their journey. You know, often in in medicine, because it's, there's so much pressure to move quickly and to, Absolutely. and there's a lot, lot going on, especially when you're working in the hospital setting, which is what I was doing. And sometimes you're just quickly like, tell me your symptoms, yeah, yeah. let me figure a diagnosis, yeah. let me get you some treatment, let me move on. And sometimes it's all you have the time to do in an right. emergency. But I think it gave me more reserve and more motivation mm -hmm. uh, to inquire about the emotional dimensions of a patient's life, which it turns out was so vital uh, to understanding what they're going through and to being a part of their healing. That's really interesting because so at a in a reverse way, uh -huh. a lot of people ask me, you know, should I go to a conservatory or should I go to a liberal arts college? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and these days some people say, well, liberal arts, you know, not so important and let's mm -hmm. go uh, for specific professions. But I just want to give you an anecdotal yeah. example of that. For me, going to college was so valuable because the courses I took, mm. you know, in Russian literature, in astronomy, and mm. as you know, in anthropology, everything that I've done since college, mm. all the projects that you talk about, refers back to something that I experienced there. So what I tell my young colleagues to say, you know, what what should I do? I kind of say to them that what you do before you're 21. It's like you're actually investing in your emotional bank account mm. from which you draw from yeah. the rest of your life. And that's what I feel at some level I've been doing, mm. that something was collated or somehow put together in a way that, that I can 
there's some reference to an arc that I can follow and say, oh, mm. now I can pick up on that thread or that thread, as opposed to say, what should I do now? Mm. You know, I don't know what to do. And and that's that's one thing. And the other thing that that what you your response about feeling connected to the pa- your patients if there's time or having more reserve in terms of the body, the skin is our largest organ. Mm. And during the pandemic, uh, at first, there were these reports of, you know, patients who were really, uh, you know, going to die, Hmm. but nobody could visit them. And everybody was in hazmat suits because you didn't know what was going on. But they were able to have an iPad and I could play music, which... As you know, if you hold something, there's a vibration, mm. and and sound moves air molecules. Mm. So it's the closest thing to being touched. Oh, that's beautiful. And so I thought, you know, I've led, led my life thinking, what's the purpose of music? Mm. You know, what's it for? Because for most people, it says, well, you know, it's dispensable it doesn't do anything it's not like we need firemen you know we need whatever but but for music and i thought at one point during the pandemic that actually there is a purpose because you know for people that let's say medicine can no longer do anything to help them mm. right they're in hospice care or whatever and and between that space and dying mm. They're fully human. Yes. And, you know, so there's a space where I think music can can actually really do something helpful in terms of comfort, in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of loneliness that that can uh, can either make or break your sense of self. That concludes part one. Join me for part two on the next episode of House Calls with Dr. Vivek Murthy. Wishing you all health and happiness.